Hi, I'm Jen Berta. Welcome to Back to Basics Bible Studies, where I share with you the Bible studies that have blessed me over the years. Today, let's look at David Guzik's Bible study on Revelation chapter 3, Jesus' letters to the churches. And this is continued from chapter 2. Let's dig in. To the church at Sardis, and this is going to cover ver uh, verses 1 through 6 of the third chapter. Let's look at the character of the city of Sardis. So the church in Sardis, at the time Jesus spoke these words to John, this ancient city had seen its best days and started to decline. It was a wealthy city, and it was situated at the junction of several uh, crossroads and trade routes. M Sardis is connected with money, easy money. And it was well known in the ancient world. Listen to what Barclay has to say. It is of interest to note that the first coinage ever to be minted in Asia Minor was minted in Sardis in the days of Croesus. These roughly formed electrum staters were the beginning of money in the modern sense of the term. Sardis was the place where modern money was born. What else about Sardis? It was well known to be soft, uh, known for its softness and, lux and luxury. It had a well-deserved reputation for apathy and immorality. In Sardis, there was a large stately temple to their mother, mother goddess Sibylle from the ruins of the temple we can see that its main columns for this goddess was 60 feet high and more than six feet in diameter. Uh, their mother goddess was honored and worshiped with all kinds of sexual immorality and uh, impurity. Sardis also had a loose moral environment that made them notorious for being soft and pleasure-loving. What does that mean, soft? It means uh, that they were unable to take a stand for anything. They were unable to commit to anything. They were unable to be faithful to anything. They were pushovers for sin. And so they were soft and they loved their pleasure. Barclay says the great characteristic of Sardis was even on uh, pagan lips, Sardis was a name of contempt. Its people were notoriously loose living, notoriously pleasure and luxury loving. Sardis was a city of decadence. This softness, this lack of discipline and dedication was the doom of Sardis on more than one different occasion. The Greek historian Herodotus tells the story of the fall of Sardis in the days of Cyrus. King Cyrus came to Sardis and found the position of the city ideally suited for defense. There seemed to be no way to scale the steep cliff walls surrounding the city. He offered a rich reward to any soldier in his army who could figure out a way to get up to the city. One soldier studied the problem carefully, and as he looked, he saw a soldier defending Sardis drop his helmet down the cliff walls. He watched as the soldier climbed down a hidden trail to recover his helmet. He marked the location of the trail and led a detachment of troops up it that night. They easily climbed the cliffs, came to the actual city walls, and found them unguarded. The soldiers of Sardis were so confident in the natural defenses of their city, they felt no need to keep a diligent watch so the city was easily conquered. Curiously, the same thing happened 
almost 200 years later when Antiochus, when Antiochus attacked and conquered the overconfident city that again didn't set a watch. Uh, Walvert says, although the situation of the city was ideal for defense, as it stood high above the Valley of Aramis and was surrounded by deep cliffs almost impossible to scale, Sardis had twice before fallen because of overconfidence and failure to watch. In 549 BC, the Persian King Cyrus had ended the rule of Croesus by scaling the cliffs under the cover of darkness. In 214 BC, the armies of Antiochus the Great captured the city by the same method. So uh, not only were they uh, negligent and unwatchful and undisciplined, overconfident, but they didn't learn from their mistakes. So Jesus describes himself to the city, uh, to the church at Sardis. These things, says he, as Jesus describes himself, he uses terms that emphasizes his character as the master of every spiritual power and authority. The repetition of the number seven helped indicate this because seven is the number of completeness in the Bible. Therefore, Jesus holds the fullness of the spirit of God and the fullness of the church. He who has the seven spirits of God. Jesus has the fullness of the Holy Spirit in himself, and he has the Holy Spirit in fullness to give to the church. And the seven stars. Jesus also has the fullness of the church in his hand. We know the seven stars represent the churches because of what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And through these letters, when Jesus speaks to the angels of the seven churches, he speaks not to one individual, but to the entire church through that individual. Point three, what Jesus knows about the Christians of Sardis. He says, I know your work. So as Jesus said to each church, he also said to Sardis, what a church is and what a church does is never hidden from Jesus. He says, I know that you have a name that you are alive. So Jesus knew the church at Sardis had a name. That is, they had a reputation of life and vitality. See, if you looked at the church of Sardis, you would see signs of life and vitality. In the church of Sardis, like the city of Sardis, everything looked alive and good. Havner says, we're not to get the impression that Sardis was a defunct affair with the building a wreck, the members scattered, the pastor ready to resign. It was a busy church with meetings every night, committees galore, Wheels within wheels, promotion and publicity, something going on all the time. It had a reputation of being a live, wide awake, going concern. Point four, what Jesus has against the church at Sardis, dead. Despite their reputation and image of life, Jesus saw them for what they really were. He says, but you are dead. Shows that a good reputation is no guarantee of true spiritual character. Despite their good appearance, Jesus saw them as dead. This indicates no struggle against anything, no fight against anything, no persecution, it wasn't that the church at Sardis was losing the battle. A dead body has already lost the battle and the fight seems over. In this letter, Jesus didn't encourage the Christians in Sardis to stand strong against persecution or false doctrine. 
probably because there wasn't a significant danger of these things in Sardis. Being already dead, the church in Sardis presented no significant threat to Satan's domain, so it wasn't worth attacking. Barclay says, Sardis was a perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. Care says that. The problem was not scandalous wickedness, but a decent death. Their image said alive, but in substance, they were dead. Barclay says the church at Sardis was at peace, but it was the peace of the dead. Point five, what Jesus wants the church at Sardis to do. Be watchful. This first instruction from Jesus told them they need to examine and protect and strengthen what they have. The things which remain tells us that though the spiritual condition of the church of Sardis was bad, Jesus said it wasn't hopeless. Spiritually, there were things which remained that could be strengthened. Jesus had not given up on them, though it was late he said they were ready, uh, the things were ready to die, but it was not too late. In its history, the city of Sardis was easily conquered twice before because of unwatchfulness. It wasn't that the attacking armies overwhelmed Sar Sardis, but because overconfidence made them stop being watchful. The spiritual state of the church in Sardis was a reflection of the city's historical character. Jesus said, I have not found your works perfect before God. This shows that their works, though present, had not measured up to God's standard. The presence of works isn't enough because God requires a particular intent and purpose in all of our works. They should be done with a heart and in a manner that show them to be perfect before God. Clark on I Have Not Found Your Works Perfect says, they perform duties of all kinds, but not duty completely. They were constantly beginning, but never brought anything to a proper end. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. So what they must do was to remember how they first received and heard the word of God. Then they must hold fast to those things and repent by turning and restoring the gospel and apostolic doctrine to authority over their lives. Paul described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the kind of reception of the word of God they needed to remember. He said, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effects effectively works in you who believe. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come to you as a thief, Jesus says. Jesus warned them of the great danger in failing to watch. If they ignored his command to be watchful, then Jesus would come upon them as a thief at a time completely unexpected. I will come upon you. How would Jesus come upon them? He would come in the sense of bringing immediate judgment, or he could come in the sense of his coming at the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Whether Jesus would come bringing immediate judgment or whether he would come rapturing the church. In either sense, it showed that he would come suddenly unannounced, so they must be watchful. Winston Churchill said to Britain in the early days of World War II, I must drop one word of caution for the next for next to cowardice and treachery. Let me read that again. Winston Churchill said to Britain in the early days of World War II, I must drop one word of caution for next to cowardice and treachery, overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness is the worst of wartime crimes. Mm. Next, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And faithful people in the middle of an unfaithful place, an unfaithful church or an unfaithful city. It is the faithful pe people that bring hope and uh, redemption, that remnant is what attracts the redemption of God to the whole matter. Even among the dead Christians in Sardis, there was a faithful remnant, but only a few names. Remember in Pergamos in Re Revelation chapter 2, 14, and in Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, there were a few bad among the good. In Sardis, there were a few good among the bad. Even in Sardis, even shows that in some ways it was remarkable that there were a few names still faithful to the Lord. It may have been remarkable because of the city's notoriously immoral reputation. Even in a city that wicked, some among the Christians had not defiled themselves by joining in sin. The phrase, who have not defiled their garments. Jesus referred to defiled garments because in the heathen worship of the day, the pagan gods could not be approached with dirty clothes. The analogy works for the worship of Jesus because he gives his people white garments. As sin is expressed under the notion of nakedness, so holiness is expressed under the notion of a garment that was Poole, uh, the commentator Poole who made that comment. The phrase, and they shall walk with me in white. Jesus also promised that these pure ones would walk with me. This picture of close fellowship and friendship is seen in Enoch who walked with God and he was not for God took him. And that's in Genesis chapter 5. Of course, the garments Jesus gives are always white. Sardis was a church that was dead because of sinful compromise. They needed to receive and walk in the pure white garment that Jesus gives. White was also the color of triumph to the Romans. So the white garment spoke of the believer's ultimate triumph in Jesus. The phrase, walk with me. This is the greatest reward Jesus can give his followers. The Christians in Sardis who forsook the sinful compromise of their city would be rewarded with a closer, more intimate walk with Jesus. This reward is ultimately a better motivator than the fear of punishment or ruin from our sin that we get to walk a closer and more intimate walk with our Savior. The pure can have greater intimacy with God, not because they have earned it, but because they are simply more interested in the things of God. God promises to reward that interest, 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Listen to what Spurgeon says on this point. But what shall be done with such persons, persons as live in the church but are not of it, having a name to live but are dead? What shall be done with mere professors who are not possessors? What shall become of those who are only outwardly religious, but inwardly are the, in the gall of bitterness? We answer as good Calvin did once. They shall walk in black, for they are unworthy. They shall walk in black, the blackness of God's destruction. They shall walk in black, the blackness of hope, dis, hopeless despair. They shall walk in black, the blackness of incomparable anguish. They shall walk in black, the blackness of damnation. They shall walk in black forever because they were found unworthy. And that was uh, from the commentator Spurgeon. A promise of reward in verse 5. The phrase, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Jesus identified the overcomers with those few names who have not defiled their garments in Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. These overcomers would wear white garments received from Jesus. The difference between the dead majority with the imperfect works, but who had a good reputation, and the few names who pleased God was purity. And the closeness with Jesus that is always related to purity, the deadness and spiritual facade of most of the Christians in Sardis was related to their impure lives, their embrace of impurity and sin of the world around them. And it's hard to say if the deadness came before the impurity or the impurity came before the deadness, but they were surely related. Jesus explained the absolute necessity of this being clothed by God with his garments of purity and righteousness in his parable of the wedding feast. And that's in Matthew 22, verses 11 through 14. And it says, but when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there were a, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Real righteousness is receiving God's covering instead of trying to cover ourselves. Adam and Eve tried to cover their own sin in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, but God provided them with a covering that came from sacrifice. The phrase, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. By this, the overcomers were assured of their heavenly citizenship. In the ancient world, death or a criminal conviction could not blot out, I'm sorry, could blot out the name of an ancient citizen from the city's book of the living, which was the city register. Listen to what Barclay has to say. In ancient times, cities kept a register of their citizens, and when a man died, his name was removed from the register. The risen Christ is saying that if we wish to remain on the roll of the citizens of God, we must keep our faith flamingly alive. The phrase blot out his name from the book of life. Does this mean that someone can lose their salvation? That someone is saved one day, their name is in the book of life, 
and another day they have fallen away and their name has been blotted out from the book of life. We need to first see the context here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. It says, The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. The focus is assurance. So we should not think that names are being constantly erased and then rewritten. The focus here is not the idea that Jesus sits in heaven with a busy eraser. At the same time, we should carefully consider what the word has to say about the book of life. One, there is a book of life and it will be opened and referenced on the day of judgment. This means that the book of life is real and will be read. Revelation chapter 20 verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Two, there is a book of life, and it determines if we go to heaven or hell. This means that the book of life is important. And any uh, Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Number three, there is a book of life. And knowing our names are written there should bring us great joy. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 20. And number four, there is a book of life, and there are five different references to people being blot out of the book. This means that the idea of being blotted out of the book of life should be taken seriously. Perhaps it is only a symbol and that person's name was never there to begin with. Even if that is the case, the Lord still wants us to take it seriously because there are some who, by every human appearance, are saved yet will not be in heaven. Moses said to the Lord in Exodus 32 and 32, Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. That's Exodus 32 and verse 33. Psalm 69 and 28 says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5, He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And then Revelation chapter 22 and verse 19 says, And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. A good example of how we should take this warning seriously is the life of a man named Charles Templeton. A generation ago, he was deeply involved in the foundations of Youth for Christ and impacted the nation for Jesus. Many people received Jesus at his meetings, and Mr. Templeton was an associate with Billy Graham in the early years. Nevertheless, he renounced his belief in Jesus, renounced even his belief in God, and said he was an atheist. Charles Templeton totally renounced his early confession of faith and wanted to rescue the people he once brought to Jesus. Obviously, 
this man in his present apostate state is not going to heaven and did not want to. One may long debate if he was ever saved or if he lost his salvation. But at the end of the debate, there are two conclusions. First, at one time, by all human appearance, he was saved. Second, he didn't honor the warnings of the Bible telling us to keep walking, to keep trusting, and to keep persevering in the faith. Point six, in the genealogies of the Bible, there are two books mentioned. The book of the generation of Adam, and that's Genesis chapter five, verse one. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. And then there's the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 said, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Being born of Adam doesn't guarantee that our name is written in the book of life. Being born again or born of Jesus Christ gives us that assurance. The phrase, But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. This was an amazing promise. It simply makes sense that we should be willing to confess the name of Jesus. But it is amazing that he would not be ashamed to confess us. It is important for us to accept Jesus, but it is far more important to know that Jesus accepts us. A general exhortation to all who will hear, and that's verse 6, the phrase, let him hear. We must all hear what the Spirit says to the church of Sardis. It is easy to drift in sleepy apathy towards spiritual death, especially when you have a good reputation to rest on. Still, there's always hope for the dead church because Jesus knows how to raise the dead. Woo, hallelujah. What the Spirit says to the churches, Sardis teaches us that we must beware of our success. The city was wealthy and knew easy living, but it made them soft and spoiled. Sardis also teaches us that we be watchful at our strongest points. Sardis thought itself to be unconquerable, and so it was conquered. Where we say, I would never do that, is the exact place we must guard against. The British Field Marshal uh, Montgomery used to say, one man can lose me a battle. One corrupt or disobedient Christian can lose a battle for an entire church. First, they can lose a battle simply through their own point of failure. Second, they can lose a battle because they lead others into their same sin. Finally, they can lose a battle because they foster a spirit of accommodation to sin in the other members of the church. One man can lose a battle. Thank you for joining me for this Bible study uh, on the book of Sardis. This was the first six verses of chapter three of Revelation. Join us for another video where we'll look at the church at Philadelphia, and that will be verses seven through 14. Please like and subscribe to my channel if you enjoy these videos. I love sharing with you the video, the Bible studies that have blessed me through the years. And so I'll see you in the next video.